Hello, good evening. Welcome to this very special edition of the program. This is Good Evening Ghana, and we have been graciously given an interview by His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Ghana. Mr. Mahama occupies two, actually three important positions in this time in the life of Ghana. He's the head of state, he's the president and leader of the government, and he's also a candidate for the December 7th elections. Your Excellency, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Paul. Yeah. Good to see you again. It's our first time in your office. It's a wonderful office. Mm, very so, simple. So this is where everything happens. Control center. <laughs> <laughs> How is Lordina, your dear wife? Um, she's fine. She's good. She's doing well, yeah. Were you happy with her that she actually wrestled the, the boom speech out of the jaws of uh, the old man, J.J. Rollins, at, at Cape Coast? <laughs> Because Mr. Rollins said she approached uh, him and said, uh, uh, please, today no boom. And, and so he postponed it almost indefinitely till after the election. No, it's, it's, it's interesting. He, she has a very wonderful relationship with him. She has a very good relation with him. Mm -hmm. And so they speak about a lot of things. And if he decided to let out what they were talking about, then that's, uh, that's, that's between them. <laughs> yeah, but they converse a lot anytime they meet. You have already started a campaign and you're already in campaign mode. Is this something that you enjoy doing? Um, you get used to it. Um, I have had a lot of experience campaigning from the grassroots level as a member of parliament. And so it's something that you do every four years. And I've done every four years since 1996. Mm. And so um, it's something you get used to. You need the stamina, you need the energy, you need a clear thought process to be able to communicate effectively with the electorate. And um, I do think that uh, God has blessed me with some of those talents. Mm -hmm. The Electoral Commission is, is the key institution for this election. And because there was a new Electoral Commission, there was somewhat anxiety at the time that she started her work. But the critical issue is she has a budget. And the concern always has been whether government will realize the budget for the Electoral Commission. At this time, as president of Ghana, the, can you confidently assure the people that uh, whatever resources that are required to prosecute this election will be made available? Um, between parliament, government, and the EC, um, when the Electoral Commission's budget was approved, we agreed a mechanism to ensure that the Ministry of Finance makes the resources available on time. And I believe that that mechanism is working. Um, I'm sure that if there were a problem, we would have seen a red flag by now. But I believe that as and when the EC is conducting its programs, the resources are made available for it to be able to do so. Still on, the, on election, uh, it was a November 7th, then it's now December 7th, uh, owing to some gymnastics in Parliament. What was your preferred date, November 7th or December 7th? There had been wide consultation mm -hmm. across uh, stakeholders. And it was agreed that the election should be on November 7th. And the reasoning behind that was that we needed sufficient time between the election and the inauguration in order that, you know, if ministers were leaving office, there would be enough time to ensure that a handing over was done in, 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 in a proper way. And so that was the main reasoning that went behind it. And so we had all prepared ourselves for November 7th. I was ready to go mm -hmm. on November 7th, mm -hmm. but um, Parliament, in its wisdom, decided that we should go back to the December 7th date. And so we're ready any date. Mm. For the election? Any date, we're ready. There's been a controversial matter in Ghana recently uh, involving your signature and the application of your authority. Three uh, gentlemen uh, were on a radio program on Moon TFM and they said things that were unpalatable. They found themselves in trouble and they got um, a Supreme Court sentence to be in prison for four months. Um, their lawyers then started talking about the powers that has been given to you under the Constitution to get them out at some point uh, of, the, of the thing. Uh, Ghanaian society was broadly divided and many people spoke about what you should do and what you shouldn't do. There's also rumors that your personal lawyer also took a position on the matter, Mr. Tony Lita. And um, everyone was watching you. We thought there would be some pressure on you because you were being pulled both ways. Eventually, you decided to apply your authority under Article 72 to remit the rest of the sentence of these gentlemen. Um, society is still divided. Some think Mr. Mahama was wrong. 
something, His Excellency was right, the authority is given to him. What underpinned your decision to, to do that? I think that the overriding consideration must be that all arms of government must act constitutionally. And I swore an oath on the 7th of January 2013 to abide by the Constitution. And so every action I take must be in consonance with the constitutional provisions. The young men were called before the Supreme Court and um, for contempt, for scandalizing the court. And even before they were called before the court, they had shown remorse, they had apologized for what they said. Before the court, they apologized again. Um, when they were sentenced in mitigation, they asked for mercy and apologized, retracted everything they said. And even after they were sentenced and left the court and went to prison, they still, you know, in written and verbal form, expressed absolute regret for what they did. I don't know what benefit it would have been to anybody if the three extra months they would have stayed in prison. I don't know. But certainly I abided rigorously by Article 72. I received a petition from the lawyers of the three and um, they stated all the grounds for which they thought that I should um, evoke my powers under Article 72, narrating every step of the way, the regret they had shown and you know, pleading for mercy. And so I did exactly what the Constitution said I should do. I referred it to the Council of State and the Council of State came back to me and recommended that I exercise my powers under 72 not in terms of pardoning them. They remain convicted, and that's what a lot of people do not uh, realize. They remain convicted. They pay 30,000 Ghana CDs in fines. That money is in the state coffers. But what I did was, instead of letting them spend four months in prison, they spent one month in prison. Indeed, if you look at the sentence, the conviction and the sentencing, the general consensus was that four months was quite a harsh a punishment to have imposed for that kind of crime. And so I believe that I acted constitutionally and um, it was in the interest of Ghana. Would you have done the same if they were not members of the NDC? Absolutely. If I, if I bring a petition tomorrow of my younger brother who is being found uh, guilty of contempt in a San Gregoire court for one thing or the other and ask you to um, look at Article 72 and, and on, please it help. It depends on the grounds. I mean, if your younger brother <clears throat> went and raped a girl and you come with a petition asking me to mitigate sentence, I most probably wouldn't. This was for the spoken word. You are a journalist, I'm a journalist. You can find yourself in the same okay. situation. All of us must walk that fine line of being careful about what we say. But there are times when journalists have found themselves in, in this situation. Harunata, Kwekubakun. Is one such case, mm -hmm. you understand? And these things happen. And when they happen, that is why the Constitution drafters created that escape valve. Our Constitution is one of checks and balances. Mm -hmm. And so you have the Parliament checking, a, a check on the uh, powers of the President. You have the Supreme Court as the final arbiter. And so there are very many checks and balances in our Constitution. And the Constitution drafters put in the prerogative of mercy for the circumstance where you know, even though a conviction might be right, there must be some extenuating, you know, power that is able to say that, yes, you were convicted properly, but, you know, we are able to grant you this remission mm -hmm. based on certain factors. And that's exactly what we did. It must not be arbitrary. And that's why there again, they said in consultation with the Council of State, mm -hmm. the Council of State is an elderly, it's a body above the president, it's an advisory body, some of the members are elected, others have served in very important positions, you know, uh, in, in their lives. And so it says the president must consult the Council of State. And so even though they give the president that power, again, they put a check on it mm -hmm. so that it's not done with arbitrary discretion. Mm. Okay, I'm, I'm sure we could have gone on about that, but let's, let's move on quickly because uh, we know that you don't have too much time. Ghana and Ivory Coast, the comparison has been going on for a while. Darkness in Ghana, light in Ivory Coast. Um,
projects in Ghana delaying, projects in Ivory Coast going on, your opponents say Watara is better than Mahama. And that's why Ghana and Ivory Coast as neighbors seem to have the situation where Ivory Coast is a better country. You are in a better place to tell us that you've been to Ivory Coast, they actually gave you a national award. You know about the ECOWAS situation. Why are we lagging behind Ivory Coast? Um, you used the very wrong word, lagging behind. We're not lagging behind Ivory Coast. And I normally don't like to compare, but we definitely are not lagging behind Ivory Coast. If you take the UN Human Development Indicators, Aside from Cape Verde, Ghana is second in the whole of West Africa in terms of access to water, in terms of, you know, um, all the various human indicators that are giving. Ghana is second. If you take the size of economy, Ghana has the second largest economy, Cote d'Ivoire is third. Like Ghana I said, is second I, after Nigeria? Yes, after Nigeria. Mm. Ghana has the second largest economy in, in West Africa. And so I normally don't like those comparisons. Because each country is at a different stage in its development. And the circumstances in each country are peculiar. But to, until, to recently, until recently, they had light, we didn't have light. Well, Cote d'Ivoire has gone through its own period when they didn't have lights. We've mm. had to exchange power. At times when they, they don't have, we have given them. At times when we don't have, they give us. Mm -hmm. And so it's not something new. Since the 70s, our two power systems have been interconnected with each other. Ghana had a Kosombo, which we thought would, would never, you know, uh, 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 finish. And so we had excess power. And so we used to give Togo, Benin, we used to give Cote d'Ivoire. Unfortunately, the results of climate change have changed things. And aside from that, it's a sign of our growing economy. Our economy has grown so fast that demand for power has ballooned. And we had not been consistent in putting in you know, enough generation to, to meet the demand. Aside from that, while demand was increasing, power from our hydro sources has been going down because of the low level of the lake, because of climate change, less rainfall and all that. So it's been a very complex situation, but I normally don't want to place mm -hmm. blame. I took responsibility to fix it, and I believe that we do have some stability in our system now. Indeed, we're going into the era of energy security. Because with so you haven't fixed it yet. We fix it. We're going into the uh, uh, the period of energy security. I mean mm. that the that period we where there. we can suffer no uh, such reversal. When will that period start? From 2017. Mm. January 2017. No, with the 10 field. You know, I went and turned the valve for the 10 field. Sometime next year, we should see about another 70 million standard cubic feet of gas. You know, coming uh, into a turbo. And then end of 2017, the ENI field will start. Mm -hmm. And sometime in 2018, we should have 150 million standard cubic feet of gas. So by the end of 2017, we should be fully energy sufficient? By the end of 2017, we should be energy sufficient. By the end of 2018, we should have excess power to be able to export that power. Because by 2017, we'll have about 70 million standard cubic feet mm -hmm. from the 10 field. By 2018, we'll have 150 million standard cubic of, uh, feet of gas from the ENI field. Mm -hmm. The total subscription we have in the West African gas pipeline is 120 million standard cubic feet. So it means ENI is going to give us much more gas than we have subscribed for from So we'll the have West enough gas, gas to power pipeline. our plant. So we'll have enough gas to power our thermal plants. We'll leave in still need additional gas if we can get it. Mm. And so all the other work that is going on is important to us making sure that we have enough and gas. All if we take Jubilee and 10 and E and I together, we're talking, you know, of about 300 million standard cubic feet of gas. And all of these... And that should produce about another 2,000 megawatts of power uh -huh. in addition to what we're producing already. Already we're producing a little over 2,000 megawatts. And so if you add another 2,000, that's 4,000 megawatts. That's from far more than Ghana, Ghana needs. So we should look at all of that and call it Muhammad Duam? No, we all do. I'll take a break <laughs> at this stage. After the break, we continue with the interview. Tell your friend and, and his friend that President JDM is on Good Evening Ghana. We'll be right back. Welcome back and thank you very much for your time um, on this edition of Good Evening Ghana. Your Excellency, um, 
you are going to Central Region. That's a statement that's been put out that you're going to campaign in Central Region. And so when we got the statement, we looked at the trend of Central Region. And the story and the outcome, unfortunately, is not very good for you because we observed that the Central Region uh, votes in a particular pattern and trend. They vote twice for a political party and then they change. So 92, 96 is NDC, 2000 and 2004 is MPP, 2008 and 2012 is back to NDC. So right now, 2016, they are turning away from you. That's, that's the trend we observed. What do you make of that? I don't know whether you've observed that trend. What do you make of that? Well, with trend analysis, it depends on the factor you're looking at. And I think that you're looking at the wrong factor. You're using the political party. Or you say, I think that is more the presidential candidate. Mm -hmm. um, you say that in two, 1992 and 1996, they voted for Rawlings. Mm -hmm. In 2000 and 2004, they voted for President Kufour. They voted for President Mills in 2008, mm -hmm. but unfortunately, President Mills did not go a second term. Then they voted for me in 12, 2012, mm -hmm. and so if they are doing you know, twice for each candidate, then it means in 2016, they will give me my second uh, at, at chance. And so okay. if you use that trend analysis based on presidential candidacy, then Central Region is going to vote for me in 2016. That, that's a very clever analysis, Your Excellency. <laughs> Central Region is going to be a key battleground. Yeah. Uh, and, and how do you hope to turn around uh, the people or keep them where they were in 2012? How do you hope to do that? Um, there, there are regions that are considered the key battleground. So some people prefer to use swing regions. Mm -hmm. And um, these are Bronga, Hafo, Western, Central, and Greater Accra, mostly. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes NDC has won, sometimes MPP has won. I believe that with... Um, Central region, um, we've done a lot of work in Central region, and with the kind of work that we've done, I do think that the people in the region are favorably disposed towards uh, my candidacy. Um, we've uh, built a new Commander Sugar Factory, mm -hmm. which should provide some 7,000 direct and indirect jobs in the catchment area of Commander and other places. We're building the Almina uh, Fish Processing uh, Factory, and you should see that factory. It would help the fishermen when they bring their catches. There are cold stores where they can keep the fish so that it doesn't go bad if they don't sell the fish that day. The fish they want to sell, they sell to the factory. The factory will process and package the fish and uh, send it off to the market. Um, we're doing the Elmina Bridge. Um, you remember the bridge was a metal foot bridge uh, going to the castle, and it had been in bad uh, state for a long time. We have replaced it with a new uh, concrete uh, bridge. We built the Cape Coast Stadium where we've refurbished the Kotokraba uh, market, which is a center of economic activity in, in Cape Coast. I was in Cape Coast um, two days ago for the Fetua Fashe Festival. And you should see the new road work that we've done in Cape Coast. Cape Coast has got a fantastic facelift in terms of its road network. But not only Cape Coast, the whole of the central region. We've done small town water systems to provide clean drinking water for uh, people so that they don't have to walk long distances to uh, fetch water. We're improving the road network in the, uh, uh, in the region. We're extending power to several communities that didn't used to have uh, power. We're building schools, uh, replacing schools under trees. We're building uh, new community senior high schools. As I go to central region this, uh, uh, this week, we're going to commission at least five of those new uh, community day senior high schools and give more opportunity for children who could not continue after GHS to be able to continue into secondary school. So I do believe that we've done quite a lot in that region to end re-election for a second term. But I must say that it's the same with all the other regions. We have worked a lot, and so even though you say they are key battleground regions, we believe that we'll be victorious in those regions. But not only that, we're carrying the battle to our opponent uh, in Eastern Region. I believe that that's a battleground too, and uh, we're going into Eastern Region with all that we have because we've done a lot of work there. And if you look at our record, we've continued to improve with every election. And so the last election, we got almost 43% in Eastern Region. And this um, year, we are aiming at 50%. Mm -hmm. And so we intend to split the votes in the Eastern Region and take 50% uh, of those votes. In Ashanti Region, we've continued to improve. And in the last election, we did almost 30%, 28 point something percent. 
And so we're looking to improve on that and increase the number of votes uh, we get from Ashanti. Whilst you talk about going into Eastern region, your opponents are also in the Northern region. And uh, this week, uh, newsrooms have been uh, confused with uh, endorsement from chiefs, Bokunaba, et cetera, of the Akufado candidate. One chief even predicted that Akufado was going to win 53%. Counter statements have come from the offices of the chiefs that perhaps the endorsement that we saw was not intended or that it didn't actually happen. But there's been a lot of campaign ground covering by Nana Kufado and Dr. Baumia in particular in the northern region. Uh, what does that say to you about the way this election is going to turn out in the northern region? I think it's about the message you send to the people. And I believe that in the nor northern region, my message has been clear and it's based on solid facts and based on a track record. And so, their mis interpretation of chiefs or what they said or what they didn't say is not really what is important. What is important is the people's belief in the candidate, the people's recognition of the track record the candidate has in terms of improving conditions of life. If you go to the uh, three northern regions, we've done a lot in terms of improving the road network. We've done the Sola Fufuso Road. Recently, I was on the uh, Laura Hamile, uh, Nandom Hamile Road. We're doing the uh, Tumu Chuchulga Road. We're doing the road from Navrongo through Tumu, Wa to Hang to join two regional capitals, Borga and Wa, have never been joined with an all-weather road before since colonial times. And this time we have contractors working on it to make sure that people can travel from uh, uh, Wa to Borgatanga in comfort and safety. We're doing irrigation dams. I inaugurated the Tamni Irrigation Dam uh, uh, cut a sort for the Tamni Irrigation Dam. Work is ongoing as I'm talking. We did the Boku Water Expansion Project, the Navrongo Water Expansion Project, which will guarantee Navrongo Town clean drinking water till the year 2025. One, one Gonja chief complained about water in, in the Gonja area. Yes, that's um, the Damango Kusogo area. Mm -hmm. that he is, says there's no water. Yeah, the water table is very low. We've done a lot to try to get them water by drilling boreholes. But it's an area where you have a very deep water table, and so they are not able to strike the water. And so it's been very difficult to provide water to communities in that area. And so we've designed a new system that will pull water from the Volta River and supply the communities there. Damango is one of them. And so we have a design. We have got a funding, but we need to send it to Parliament mm. and to approve it before work starts. And so that has been our main difficulty with that area. And so the chiefs have been complaining about you know, water starvation. I'm aware of it. And we're doing something to uh, alleviate it. We thought that if we drilled additional boreholes, we could improve the amount of water that was being received. But they don't have very viable water supply using underground water. So now we have to use surface water. But what it means is that we're going to have to draw the water from a distance to Damango uh, town. And then there are several other communities like Yape. Yape is just by the white water. That should be very easy to do. The um, campaign started, and uh, some of your critics were suggesting that you are attacking your opponent. At, in, in Cape Coast, um, uh, Nilante van der Poy complained uh, or commented about, about your candidate's height. Uh, unfortunately, he did. Um, but Your Excellency, you, you talked about the candidate being divisive when you started your campaign. Uh, people think that maybe you shouldn't attack. Was it an attack? I don't think it was an attack. Um, <clears throat> you said he has divided his party. Well, what do you think he has done? What has, do you think he has he done? Has he divided his party? Of course, MPP is divided. But let me start from the beginning. I mean, mm -hmm. what do you call attack? I mean, for four years, he's described me as incompetent. Mm -hmm. For four years, he's described me as visionless. For four years, he's described me as a thief. He says, when I come to power, I'll steal your money. What does that mean? It means I'm stealing Ghanaian's money. I, I'm a politician. I know it's an occupational hazard, you know, sometimes to have your opponents vilify you or something. And so I don't take it as anything. And so I'm talking about, <clears throat> I'm campaigning, and I'm saying that we need, at this stage of Ghana's history, somebody who can bring the nation together. And my opponent's track record does not fit that role because in his own party, he's not able to bring his people together. 
Today, that is the truth. People can criticize Akufuado and MPP. If you criticize him, they will suspend you or they will sack you or his attack dogs will set on you. Ask people in MPP. They are quiet. And that's why I said a good number of people in MPP are quiet. They can see the bus is going to crash. But if they say it, they will attack them. And so they are quiet, waiting for the bus to crash. And when it crashes, I said, they'll take the bus, send it to Kokompi, repair it, and put it back on the road for 2021. He should learn to accept criticism. I do. People insult me, vilify me. I don't want to tie a word. Mm -hmm. And so when I say, you cannot unify your party, so you cannot unify Ghana, and I think that the kind of president Ghana needs at this stage in our history is one who can bring us together. And so you must prove a track record that you can bring people together. And I don't, most people don't think that he can do that. Mm. Well, it's true, though, that you have, uh, you have, you have uh, taken attacks in good faith because sometimes you actually respond to the attacks with a uh, Usain Bolt pose in the <laughs> photograph. But this Kokompe bus that you are talking about that is going to crash, the Economist Intelligence Unit has twice predicted this year that the MPP will win the elections. And this is the Economist Intelligence Unit that predicted in 2012 that you will win the elections. And they also predicted that the Supreme Court verdict will endorse your victory of 2012. Now they have said something else that it looks like Akufado will win the election. They put a caveat, and you should have read the caveat. Mm -hmm. They said it depends on the performance of the economy. Mm -hmm. They said it depends on the performance of the economy. Yes. And they said at the time they were making the assessment, we had we were in the middle of the power crisis. The economy was still struggling for stability. Since then, things have changed. Factors have changed. The economy is more stable. We just finished the third review uh, mission. It just left last week. And things are on track. The IMF is going to go to the board on the 21st and endorse Ghana's uh, continued program. We've managed to stabilize the power situation. And currently, Ghanaians can see the volume of work that we've done. Probably at the time the EIU uh, did its prediction, we had not started selling our story. We hadn't come out with a green book. We hadn't started you know, letting Ghanaians see the extent of the work that we had done. And I believe that they are beginning to comprehend what we're doing and where we're going. And so the EIU made that prediction. Yes, but they put a caveat and said that depending on you know, the trend, it was his, they said it was not a foregone conclusion and that it depended on you know, what happened on the economic front. Still, in terms of how people felt. But even if you take the CDD uh, report, mm -hmm. the CDD said over 30% of people feel that their lives are better. Mm -hmm. About another 30% believe that things have not changed. And only about 25% feel that their lives have gotten worse. And so you can see that the trend is not the same across but the CDD also said 70% of Ghanaians think that the country is being led in the wrong direction. But they also, 48% said that they uh, give me approval for my presidency, mm. and they believe they have confidence in me. Mm. The, um, so you need to look at it <laughs> variably. But I believe that we're going in the right direction. We've been faced with challenges, and I've always said that I haven't made Ghana a paradise, but from what I took over from my predecessors, I'm taking Ghana to the next level. And when I get a second term, you know, we would see the direction in which we are able to take things. Your Excellency, your opponent has once again punctuated the campaign with major fundamental promises. One dam, one village, and one district, one factory. Same way as he punctuated the campaign with free SHS, um, which you carried on uh, as well. How are you relating to his sort of leadership in, in the campaign, in telling people what he actually wants to do? I think that in campaigning, you put out a program, and um, <clears throat> your program speaks to what you intend to do over the next uh, four years, if you're giving the mandate. And there are linkages in everything that you do. Things do not stand in isolation. And so if you just pick one this, one this, one this, one that, win this, what does it relate to? It must be linked to something. And so I'm sure when his manifesto comes out, we'll understand better what his linkages are. But for instance, you take one dam, one village, one dam, or one dam, one village. You know, you need to understand what is he talking about. He said in the north, irrigation. in the north, what we call dam in the north is a dugout. 
And Weather. every village has a dugout. It's a mm -hmm. pond. We used to drink from it in the north before when there was no water. Mm -hmm. But now that most communities have water, the dugouts are used for livestock watering. Now, if you want to do irrigation dams, irrigation dams must have a feeding source of water. And so you are talking of barrage dams and proper irrigation dams. Proper irrig barrage dams are if a stream is flowing and then you put a wall across it, then you hold the water back. You can use that for dry season gardening, but not every village has a stream flowing by it. And so if you say one village, one dam, and you talk about the dugouts, the dugouts by the end of the dry season, the water is finished, they are, they are dried up. And so he needs to, that's what I'm saying, when his manifesto comes out, we'll understand what he's talking about. But if he's talking about dugouts, Sada is doing dugouts for villages. The problem even now is not the dugouts, it's desilting them. Most of the dugouts are silted. And so Sada is having a program to desilt the dugouts so that they can accumulate more water for the cattle and other animals to be able to get water. Now most of our communities use boreholes for drinking water. In the dry season, if the borehole is not pre, uh, very productive, then what they do is they drink the water from the borehole, but then they wash their clothes in the dugout. And so until he comes and explains exactly what it means, you know, then one can't understand. But as for barrage dams, irrigation dams, we're already doing them under the Ghana Commercial Agricultural Pro Program. We're doing barrage dams for irrigation. When I went to Boko, I cut the sort for the Tamni irrigation dam. We've done the dam at Brenham. We are revamping the VR irrigation project. We are revamping the Bontanga irrigation project. We are revamping the, uh, um, the one at uh, Navrungu, the tunnel irrigation project. We are revamping all those and bringing them at, at agriculture. There's a huge irrigation project that is going to take place under the, in, in the overseas area. It's called the Coupon Sicily project. And that is going to bring about 20,000 hectares of land under irrigation. And so the work that is going on in the north is massive. And so if you just come and say one village, one dam, you really haven't said anything. He's just talking about factories. He's talking about factories in district. It depends on what factories. We, 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 this thing about one uh, factory per district came out under the Rural Enterprise Program. It's not a new idea. It's an old, a very old idea. Mm. But you need to look at the viability of those industries. As a student of economics, the location of industries or factories is based on mm. several factors. You have to take those factors into consideration. For instance... Proximity you, to raw material and all that kind of thing. Proximity to raw material, proximity to port, proximity to market, cheap labor, um, power, water, all those things are things you take into consideration. So for instance, in some district, you cannot put a textile factory because the source of power is not sufficient. You need a strong substation in the district to be able to power a textile factory. So if you are talking of small and medium enterprises, like gary making factories, small processing factories, where we use gratis machines and things, that is happening already. Hmm. So you're so, saying that the promises are not new? They are not new. Under the Rural Enterprise Program... There are things that your government is already doing. Yeah, but it, was, it, it envisaged small and medium enterprises. What we're doing is small and medium enterprises, we're facilitating the private sector to do. Mm. Government will not involve itself in going to set up a small uh, or medium enterprise in a community. We will enable the private sector to do it. And that's what we're doing. There are fabrication uh, factories where they're doing fabrication. There are people who have uh, small uh, share butter processing factories in the, in the districts. So unless he comes and tells us, is he coming to uh, do uh, uh, electronic appliances? He's coming to do textiles and garments. Is he coming to do car assembly plants in the districts? You know, if, if you talk about those factories, people's conception of factories differ. Yeah. So if you say factory, then it means some big steel making plants in Bole district. We would love that, but where we, it means you have to track all the iron rods to Bole or all the metal to Bole and fabricate it Generally, you're before you send it. Better clarification. He of, has to clarify of, of what he's doing. Yeah, okay, he has a message. tendency to do that. Oh, he I has see. a tendency to do that. In the free school program, when you came down to the figures and the and nitty gritty, he found it very difficult to explain. It's the same thing that is happening here. You just throw out a promise. That's the old, yesterday's campaigning in those days, you know, my father's time. 
You just throw out something, and then people just pick it. One village, one dam, one village, one dam. They don't know if it's a dugout, or it's a barrage dam, or it's a proper irrigation dam. They don't know. But then just because you say one but, village, but, one dam, but. one village, one factory, what kind of factory? Is it a car assembly plant? Is it the kind of factories we know, electronic appliance, textiles and garments, are those the plants or small and medium enterprises? If they're small and medium enterprise factories, that is happening already. Mm. But he said, to be fair to him, he said, free SHS. Yes, you may be right about the, the crunching of the numbers was not available, but you didn't say it, he said it. You picked it up and you have carried it out. No, no. And your supporters give you credit for I said that I said that it wasn't a new idea there again. Mm -hmm. I said because the constitution enjoined us mm -hmm. yeah. to introduce it progressively. progressively yes. And I said that I was enjoined by the constitution to do it progressively. Mm -hmm. He said free SHS now. But I said that access was more important because if you made it free and the schools were not there for the children to go to, what was the use? And so I was going to put resources into expanding access but I'll progressively introduce it. That was my program. And his program was free SHS now. He didn't talk about access, he didn't talk about quality. Those were the differences. Have you actually? So now again, it? it's the same, just throwing out the promises mm -hmm. like they used to do in those days. One village, one dam. One village, one factory. What kind of factory? What kind of dam? If it's dugouts, we don't need dugouts. Let's come to your promises, Your Excellency. So. In 2012, you won the election. It's been four years now. Uh, you made promises. You now have put up a green book. You said you are transforming Ghana. You have begun the process. Where is the evidence of this transformation? Do you think that the ordinary Ghanaian who walks in front of Flagstaff House will say, uh, if he's non-partisan, will say that indeed there has been transformation in Ghana? Why would he say that? I focused on five main areas. And in those five main areas, I believe that Ghanaians would see that some investment has gone into these areas. If you look at access to water, we've taken access to water from 58% in 2008 to 76% in 2014, 2015. That is a quantum jump. Urban water and rural what water. What you mean is 76% of Ghanaians now have access, have access to, to clean drinking when water. When in 2008, 58%. It was 58%. Okay. And so today, I mean, I don't know if you live in the northern part of um, Accra, which used to be very water-staffed, Adenta, East Legon, mm -hmm. and other areas. I mean, if you live there, you would see that there's been a transformation because we're pumping in 20 million gallons more of water into Accra. From the desalination plant, we're pumping in another... 10 million gallons of water. We've increased supply of water into Accra by more than 50 million gallons. And so more people are getting access to water, and that is just Accra. We've done small town water systems. They are uncountable all over the country. So water is one of them. So water is one of them. Electricity is the other. In electricity, we have continued to extend power to all parts of the country. And so we've increased our access to power to almost 80%. And it is uh, uh, considered that in sub-Saharan Africa, Ghana is second only to South Africa in terms of access to power. So that's better than Kenya? Yes. Better than Nigeria? Second in sub-Saharan Africa. Better than Cote d'Ivoire? Second in sub-Saharan Africa. Better than Zimbabwe? Second in sub-Saharan Africa. We'll, we'll check that. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's... That, we that. have almost 80% of our people having access to power. Mm. And we are continuing to expand. And I believe that with the new communities that we're going to cut, bring onto the grid, almost 1,800 to 2,000 of them, we should cross the 80% uh, mark. Of course, there are some communities that you will find difficult to reach with the national transmission grid because of the remoteness from the grid system. And so what we're doing is we're covering those communities with solar power. And so they, even though they are not using electric power, are able to get electricity using solar generated uh, modules. And so we've done quite well in power uh, generation. Now that our power generation has stabilized, then it means that all those that we have connected onto the system are able to get more power. So that's uh, electricity. Aside from that, if you take healthcare, mm -hmm. we are building polyclinics, we're building health centers, we're building CHIPS compounds, we're building regional hospitals, we're building teaching hospitals all across the country. Our policy is that every district should have a good health facility. 
And no, so the I mean, let me capture that in propaganda terms. So our one, policy one district, is that okay. I, if if I were <laughs> the politician of old, mm -hmm. I'll say one district, one hospital. Okay, so that's yes. what you're doing. One district, one hospital. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure that that is how my opponent, you know, mm -hmm. uh, puts his things. But that's how many mechanic. hospitals are building. But our district, mm -hmm. we have 216 districts. Mm -hmm. Some have hospitals already. Yeah. Others don't, especially some of the newly created districts don't have hospitals. And so we've prioritized those newly created districts. And so we're building polyclinics, depending on the population. It's either a full-fledged hospital or a polyclinic that we can later upgrade into a hospital as the population continues to increase. And so we built five polyclinics in Upper West Region. We built five polyclinics in Northern Region. We built five polyclinics in Western Region. We built five polyclinics in Bronga Hafu Region. We're building 10 polyclinics in Central Region. We're building another five polyclinics in Greater Accra Region. And we're sourcing the funding for building another five polyclinics in the Volta Region and Eastern Regions. Aside from that, district hospitals, we're building several district hospitals. The Shai Sudoku District Hospital at Dodoma, I don't know if you've seen it, mm -hmm. is one of such. We have Kumewu, we have Abetifi, we have... Um, so many of them, I, I, if I, if, I, I can't remember exactly how many, but there are so many of them. Then so we have, health, yeah. yes, then we have regional hospitals. We're building the new Wa Regional Hospital. We're building the Bolga Regional uh, Hospital. We've actually got another 20 million to expand uh, phase two of the Bolga uh, Upper West Regional Hospital. We're building the Takrade uh, Hospital. Um, we're building the Rich Hospital, which is going to become the Greater Accra regional hospital to ease the pressure of Kolebu. That's going to be a 620 bed uh, hospital. And then we're building the new University of Ghana teaching hospital. That allows them to move their teaching you know, on campus and make it a center of excellence in terms of medical care. And so in the field of medicine, we need to put in the facility so that people can have access. What use is it to have um, um, uh, affordability in terms of a national health insurance scheme when you do not have the facility to be able to, you know, access that health care. So that has been one of our focuses. Aside from that, we have increased the number of health training institutions to about 95 from around 34 to about 95. So it means that more health professionals are being trained, health assistants, doctors, and other paramedical staff are all being trained so that we can staff these uh, hospitals. Aside from that, we did the um, retrofitting of all the existing hospitals with new medical equipment. It cost us more than $200 million to replace all the old x-rays, all the old MRI scans, all the uh, electrocardiograms and everything. And we did it for all the major hospitals. They received new equipment so that they are functioning at optimum they're able to do their diagnostics and be able to give proper care to people. So healthcare is one area in which we have made a, a, a major investment. Aside from that, we concentrated on education. In education, it's been from tertiary right down to primary. Of course, under primary and basic, our focus has been on eliminating the schools and the trees. And from our account, we've built about 1,670 of those uh, new schools and the trees. It's not only schools and the trees, but also substandard schools. Where there's a school but it's substandard, we have taken it out and put a new school uh, block. In uh, secondary education, of course, we realized there was a bottleneck, and so I came with the 200 community day senior high schools. So far, 123 have been given on contract. There are different stages of completion. They are being populated as they are being finished. And I know that in my second term of office, by 2021, would have built all the 200 and they'll be operational and they'll have children in them studying, you know, and being able to realize their full potential. At the tertiary level, we've added the new uh, um, universities, UHAS. I inaugurated their campus, their new campus, uh, a few months ago. The University of Energy and Natural uh, Resources. We've passed the um, Eastern University, which is the University of Environment and Sustainable Development. We've passed the bill through Parliament, and we've allocated $50 million to establish their uh, campus. Aside from that, we um, are building autonomous universities out of the three UDS universities. We're developing their infrastructure so that at a certain point, we can create separate universities out of 
the University of Development uh, uh, Studies. And so there are all these projects that are going, going on. Have you seen the SSCE results, the latest one? Yes, I have. It was very bad. What do you mean by very bad? Well, it was reported that it's one of the worst results that we had had uh, in terms of failure that, that rate. That is the misinformation. Is it you know? misinformation? Absolutely. Absolutely misinformation. And I believe that the media should go beyond the propaganda that we politicians do. As soon as the results came out, some people came out and, you know, talked about abysmal results and things. We have been improving in the West African Senior Secondary School like certificate exams for the last three years. So this year is an improvement for the last, last year? three years. Ghanaians have topped the best three, first, second, third has come no, in from terms Ghana. Of the aggregate performance. And that's coming. I'm telling you from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I said for the last three years, the whole of West Africa Exams Council exams, those who take it, Ghanaians have topped taking mm -hmm. the, the, those positions. But if you come and look at performance, we mm -hmm. normally look at aggregate A1 to C6 and see mm -hmm. how many. Because C6 is a credit. Yeah. So from C6 to A1, mm -hmm. we see what percentage of the students got A1 to uh, C6. Mm -hmm. And in last year's uh, results, 24.7% of the children had A1 to C6. 24? In 2007, 10%, 10 10.4% or 10.5% had A1 to C6. And so how can you call 24% abysmal? Of course, we are not satisfied with it. We want to do but even better. it's very better. low, isn't it? If 24% are getting A1 to C6, is that not very low? Even though I come to a 2007 shocking one, but is that not low? We, that's why I say we're not satisfied with our performance, but it has been improving year on mm. year. Indeed, in 2012, we achieved in excess of 30%. Okay. And I don't remember the exact figure, but 2012 was our best mm. performance year. But we have continued to improve and last this year that was, was said to be abysmal and said uh, education is declining it rather is going up it's higher than it so was so 2007 when the mpp was in power yes the pass rate or the achievement rate of students from a1 to c6 was, was just 10 percent in 2007 it was 10.5 percent also 10 wow. 10.5 percent was I that can, was that the lowest in the last 20 years it was the most abysmal performance we had ever had under the mpp administration yes so the point you're making is that they shouldn't be the people telling us that this one was abysmal. Well, I didn't want to compare. You said, uh, they said it, it was yes, abysmal. It was, uh, that's what everyone is uh, saying. And I'm saying that we're doing much better than we did in 2007. 2007 was the worst uh, performance. 2012 was our best. Let's lead this to teacher's allowance and all. where are we on those matters? Um, teacher's allowance, it was reported that it's been uh, terminated by government. And then later oh, on, no, it was said it's been teacher training, teacher training allowances. allowance. Yes, it was not terminated. It wasn't terminated. Are you still paying teacher training allowance? It was substituted with what? If you say it was terminated, it means that we just stopped it arbitrarily. Yes. Yeah, so what did you substitute it with? It was substituted with the student loan scheme. What had happened? Was, like the university students do. Yes. What had happened was we had upgraded the colleges of education to tertiary institutions mm -hmm. and degree awarding institutions. Mm -hmm. Now, the colleges of education are not the only institutions awarding degrees to professional teachers. You have the University of Education, Winneba, you have the University of Cape Coast, and even Legon is producing teachers. Mm -hmm. Now, University of Education, Winneba, University of Cape Coast, and Legon, the students who are training to be professional teachers take the students' loan like students, uh, any students in any university. Mm -hmm. But then the colleges of education we're still taking the students' uh, teacher training allowance. And so for reasons of equity, because all of them are going to go back with the same certificates mm -hmm. and go and teach in the same schools, and these ones take students' loan, and these ones take teacher training allowances. That's the first thing. The second thing is that with the substitution, we realized that with the substitution of teacher training allowances with student loans, we could increase the capacity of the uh, colleges of education to take in more students. Mm -hmm. So since we did that substitution, enrollment in teacher training colleges has gone up 63.8%. It means that 63.8% of the students in colleges of education today would not have been there if we had continued to maintain the teacher training allowances. And so there are several students I've met who understand, you know, and one of them told me, he said, seriously, I would not, 
have been in training college by now. I tried twice. I wasn't taken. So it's a good policy? For him. I, he tried twice. He wasn't taken. Mm -hmm. It was when I substituted it for students' loan, and we asked them to increase their capacity that he was able to go in. And today he's training. He's in second year. Mm -hmm. He'll finish third year, and then he'll come out. He get, has a job as a professional teacher. He would not have had that opportunity if we had continued to pay teacher training allowances. And so it's for two reasons. One, equity. A matter of equity. The same teacher trainees are in University of Education. The same teacher trainees are in Cape Coast. The same teacher trainees are in Legon. Why must they, because they are in these institutions, take the student loan, but then those in the colleges of education must take teacher training allowances? You know? And so, one, for equity. Two, in order to improve and expand capacity, so that more students you know, can have the opportunity to train and be able to uh, mm -hmm. earn a job as a professional teacher. So you talked about health and you talked about, um, about education and um, you also talked about infrastructure. What's the other area that you believe you have improved Ghanaian lives? Um, we've improved in the area of roads. We're doing a lot of massive work when it comes to the road network. One of the things I noticed in both 2008 and 2012, when I went around the country on the campaign, and even as president traveling around the campaign, was the very bad nature of most of the roads in the country. And any chief I went to, they complained that the major issue, the major problem they have is a road network. And so I decided that we must do something about it. So we have three sources of funding. We have the Government of Ghana budget, which is approved by parliament every year. And then we introduced the Cocoa Roads Improvement Pro Program, um, of which we take $150 million every year from the Cocoa Flotation. And we dedicate it to improving roads in the six cocoa growing regions. And then the third source of funding is the Enhanced Road Fund, which was passed as part of the energy levy. And so under that, we have identified strategic roads in the country, and we're paying to improve those roads. The good thing about all these programs is that 95% of the contractors engaged in this road work are Ghanaians, indigenous Ghanaian companies. Mm -hmm. And so it means that unlike in the past, where we had contractors from other countries coming and you know, doing all those works, today we have our own Ghanaian contractors doing this work. They are earning that money. They are employing Ghanaian civil engineers they are employing Ghanaian excavator operators, bulldozer operators. They are employing Ghanaian laborers on their sites and everything. And so that money is being recirculated you know, within the Ghanaian economy. And that's a good thing. One of the statistics I cite is that before I came into office, only six foreign contractors had asphalt plants in this country. Today, 22 contractors have asphalt plants. And out of this uh, 22, at least 16 of them are Ghanaian contractors who have their own asphalt plants. And so a lot of the asphalting you see being done in the night and things are being done by Ghanaian companies. Mm -hmm. so and so Ghanaian companies, one, we've, um, um, we've created Ghanaian companies that are becoming world class in terms of road construction. Mm -hmm. And so if we have major road works to do, we don't need to bring foreign contractors to do it. That's one. And then two, we've created jobs in the road construction industry. Not only the road construction industry, all these massive infrastructural works we have been doing engage Ghanaians. You go to every site, I've been to the hospitals, I've been to the schools while they are being built, and you see masons, you see bricklayers, you see steel benders, you see foremen, you see machine operators. I mean, and they are all Ghanaian. We estimate that at least half a million jobs have been created as a result of public works. 500,000. Yeah, uh, we estimate that on all the building sites and road have you sites. Had, have you encountered any bad roads on this campaign so far? Oh, yes, plenty. Uh, the work is a lot. It's because a lot what what they say is that when the pictures come on social media, yeah. especially of Akufado's campaign, they say, so that's the convoy, that's a bad road we encountered. Here is President Mahama saying that he's done the roads. Where are the roads that he's done? In fact, there's actually a photograph of uh, a 4x4 vehicle which appears very dirty on a mad road. And yeah. Dr. Manibu Ama and uh, Joyce Bauer are standing <laughs> behind it. And it's going around and they said, here are the Mahama good roads. <laughs> so if the roads have been done, why are you encountering bad roads on the campaign? How do you feel when you see these pictures coming out and say that 
Where are the well, roads? Well, did I ever say I have done all the roads in Ghana? No, I've, no, you didn't. I've, you start somewhere. Mm. The roads were bad. Mm. I've started somewhere. Mm. You know, and um, yes, there are still bad roads, and we're going to come to them. Because as we finish these, we're going to... The thing is to have a program, which is what we have. We have a program. And I've said that 150 million every year for five years into the six cocoa growing regions. And so as the contractors finish, they are being given other roads to do. And under the enhanced program, as they finish these roads, they are being given other roads to do. And so when I say I've done roads, it doesn't mean that you go and look for a bad road somewhere and say, oh, but President Mama, there's a bad road here. Yes, we'll come to it. What percentage and that's why, that's why I deserve a second term mm. to be able to do those roads that you're complaining about. So that's campaign 2016 right in the president's office. I'll be back after the break. Thank you and welcome back uh, to the program. I hope that you are enjoying the interview and you are making your notes as well. Uh, I'm sure that you can always uh, contact President Mahama on the social media and he will answer all the questions you have. He has one million uh, followers on social media. Uh, should I say congratulations for that? I um, recorded a message to my I've followers. Seen it, yeah. Yeah. A lot of people have seen on it. On one million, yeah. Mm, I see. So hopefully you get to two million before the election. Before the 2016? Yes, yeah, before December. Wow. I hope, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> There's been a, um, an uncomfortable matter in the media about the campaign again and also about your opponents. The Africa Watch magazine had published uh, his health records. They had alleged all sorts of ailments against him. They had also published about uh, Mr. Rollins earlier. The uh, Nanaku Fado's doctor was on radio to deny the claims and said that he's healthy. It has sort of re-engineered a debate about the health of uh, political leaders, especially when they are campaigning. We know too well of the case of Professor Mills. Uh, as president, what is your reaction to this story? It's, as a um, historian, I, I, I can't help but note that history comes around, you know, because um, I remember we've been here before um, in the period when Professor Mills was campaigning and I was his running mate. Um, our opponents raised the issue of his health and continued to hammer the issue of his health. And um, here we are again with the same thing, you know, coming up with issues about somebody's health being raised. I've told my, my compatriots that we don't run on the health of, of our opponents and so we don't make that an issue. Um, but it has come up for public debate. I noticed in the US election too there were issues about you know, candidates' health and things. So it's something that people will talk about. But um, I don't take advantage of a person's health. You know, to, I believe that I have enough to talk about without you know, running on somebody's health Is record. Is it improper for a magazine to publish health records? Um, with journalism, you need to look at the ethics. If you read the story, did they breach anything? It has to do with patient privilege and things. How did they come by that information, you know, and things like that. But it's for um, the public to discuss and see whether any ethics were breached or whether it was proper or improper. I'm not the right person to judge. But like I've said, it's not an issue for me. I have enough to talk about to the electorate, and I believe that. I'll be elected not based on somebody's health. I'll be elected based on my own merits and what I have done, you know, for my country in the should four years ask you that I have served as president. Should we ask you, the candidates, to voluntarily tell us your health status? Park Wesi Indum has already said that. Should we ask you to do that? Should we have asked Professor Mills to do that? If there's a consensus and Ghanaians indicate that they would want to know the uh, health records of uh, candidates. I would voluntarily give my health records. I feel well and um, I have energy. I'm okay, I think. I, and I'm president already. I'm carrying out my job without any this disadvantages and so I, I don't have any problem giving out my health records. But like I'm saying, I won't take advantage of somebody's health to run. I have enough to communicate with the electorate about without being distracted by you know, how somebody uh, feels or what the person's state of health is. Your Excellency, there's another matter. Um, a journalist in Joy FM 
Manasse put up a, an investigative report and he found out that um, a, a, a contractor, a Bukina Bay contractor, uh, who had done road construction in Ghana, who was also responsible for constructing the wall in Burkina Faso, uh, our embassy in Burkina Faso in Ouagadougou, had given you a gift, uh, a Ford vehicle, uh, that apparently had not been disclosed uh, to the Ghanaian people. And um, since then, um, people have said that there's a conflict of interest against President Mahama. In fact, people have gone to the Commission of Human Rights, and you have been notified about it, uh, about this Ford gift. Last week, the MPP uh, occasioned a parliamentary sitting out of Parliament's regular session to get the Parliament to discuss it and set up a committee um, to look at the matter, uh, whether you had breached a, a rule one way or the other. Basically, on conflict of interest and on corruption alarm bells, the Speaker, in his wisdom and under the strength of the law, said that the matter was properly before Shraj. Now, since this is the first time we're speaking to you uh, after this matter broke, what is the real story about the Ford? Um, well, the matter is before charge, as the speaker rightly said, and um, I cannot comment on the merits of the of the issue because it's under investigation. In order that I don't prejudice that investigation, but I can talk about the processes. Yes, um, a complaint was made against me by two individuals, and um, charge to charge, and charge wrote to me and detailed various issues that they wanted answered. And so to get out my lawyers, we answered those questions. They've been conducting their investigations ever since then. They have interviewed several people. They have visited the Flagstaff House, our transport section, and done many things. And so once that investigation is ongoing, I have submitted myself to it. and. Um, I submit myself to any verdict that uh, Chiraj will come up with. Now, while this investigation is going on, and it's been going on for a while, it was going on while Parliament was in session, um, wh whoever signed that motion did not sign the motion at the time. They waited till Parliament went on recess for many weeks, and then you sign and ask the Speaker to call back Parliament. The, system, the speaker is constitutionally enjoined to call back if you get that required number of signatures, which they had got. And then you come back to Parliament and he says, set up a parallel investigation to what charge is setting up. I mean, as seasoned members of Parliament, they should know that it was untenable. And so to waste people's resources, anytime we call back Parliament, we have to pay them TNT to come to Parliament, we have to pay them TNT to go back home. While Parliament is in session, all the materials they need and everything have to be provided, you know. So I think it was a frivolous waste of taxpayers' money. There are case law studies that say Trudge is the constitutional body properly imbued with the powers to investigate abuse of office and a code of conduct of uh, office holders. And Trudge was doing exactly that. Why recall Parliament to come and listen to, for, uh, to a motion to investigate? Initially, they had given us the impression, and the media had also given us the impression, that it was a motion to impeach. If yeah. it was a motion to impeach, it's a completely different matter. It lies within the ambit of Parliament to do that. And so you say you're recalling uh, Parliament because you wanted to impeach the president. Yes, the speaker calls it. Then you say a motion for a bipartisan investigation, you know. I think that we should, we should, You're we should. You're clearly angry with the MPP's process. No, I'm not angry. I'm sad. Why? You know, it's, 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 it's petty politicking. Everybody knows the, what, what, what the, you know, reasoning behind that whole gerrymandering was. It, it was, it absolutely was unnecessary. It's petty politicking. Do, do you think sad. all of us Ghanaians and especially the media are, are, are making a smoke screen out of this fort and it's not a big deal? Well, let's leave that to try it. Are you confident that you come out of the strike process? I, I did no wrong. I'm confident I did no wrong. Let's look at international politics, uh, what's happening these days. And Ghana and America run elections uh, all the time. Again, in the trend analysis, we've noticed that when the Americans vote for center-left, Ghana also votes for center-left. So um, when we're voting on November 7th, um, this was the first time Ghana was going to vote before the Americans. So the trend would have failed. Now we are back to the same place. So. In 92, they vote center-left. 96, they do. We, all, we always do what they do. We do what they do in December when they do it in November. So we're looking out to see what happens. But here's an, an emerging trend in American politics, a phenomenon 
uh, known as Mr. Donald Trump. I'm sure that you've been observing. Uh, whilst he's not of your uh, political philosophy because he's on the right, what do you think about Mr. Trump? Um, I think when you're in school, you love trend analysis. You like all this, you know, <laughs> analyzing trends and all that. But um, what do I think of Mr. Trump? I, I think it's for the American people to decide what they think about him. Um, I'm a social democrat, and so he being on the right of center, I don't agree with a lot of the policies he's espousing, but it's not in my mouth to make a determination of that. I think that the ultimate people to decide you know, whether his rhetoric is acceptable to them is the American electorate, and so let's leave it at that. When can I join you on the campaign? Anytime. You are invited anytime. Where do you go from, Central Region? Um, we have a couple of regions lined up. Our uh, campaign team determine which the next region will be. Mm -hmm. But certainly, Central Region is in the periscope. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure that it's going to be a very interesting uh, campaign. We're doing 16 constituencies mm -hmm. in okay. five days. Oh, that's a lot. Yes. That's, that's a lot of work. Yeah, 16 constituencies in five days. And you'll be speaking every day? Every day in multiple constituencies. Mm. Yeah. What do you live on? What do you feed? Do you, do you have more water, more juice, more...? You have to take a lot of liquids. And mm. um, my doctors asked me to take a lot of fluid. So water, I drink a lot of water. Mm. And then I drink a lot of tea, black tea. So no fufu on that? No, 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 no. When I'm on the campaign trail, I, I don't like to feel heavy. So I don't eat heavy. Food. I take light, light food. Mm, I see. Yeah. Mm, I see you enjoy that. I'll take that. some soup or something. That's it. And then. You take biscuits? No, I don't eat biscuits. Do you take granite? I like granites. You take atadri? <laughs> atadri? Yes. Atadri is seasonal, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like atadri. Mm, okay. You know. I like granites, yes. The international media have noticed a certain, I don't know whether it's a symbiotic relationship or a certain closeness between you and Uhuru Kenyatta, the Kenyan president. Is it, are you, the guys, do you look so uh, uh, close to each other uh, and you seem to like each other quite well because you are sharing the same strengths and weaknesses with Uhuru Kenyatta? The same strengths and weaknesses, I don't know about that. I have many friends amongst my colleagues, uh, presidents. Um, Makisal is somebody that I relate with very well. Um, Yai Boni was somebody I related with very well. Um, yes, Uhuru is somebody I relate with uh, quite well. Uhuru, it might be uh, maybe relatively our, our generational, you know, uh, similarities. His father was Kenyan president. My father was a minister in the First Republic at the same time that Nkrumah and all his colleagues were there. So it might be that generational similarity. I don't think there's anything. Uh, and toward uh, about it. But I have many friends amongst all the African presidents. Mr. Bahama, thank you. And thank good luck. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks. That's good evening, Ghana. Good night.